See, before I draw the line, let me welcome you close to all the folks who know Obama sold the people of hopes, gave the money to suckers while our community still poor, withdrew the troops but started another war, colonizing, terrorizing, creating the oil crisis, so they can make a killer, no food and gas prices, prisons are spinning, they trying to lock up the future, militarize borders and control of computers, want a stupid bump of music that ain't healthy for the shortest, privatizing schools and policemen in the homes, can't be dormant out of wealth and violence. So be ready, brought the family with us, and we hope the machete. Riding the fence, riding the fence, too many people be riding the fence. Yeah, you say you're ready for war, but are you convinced? I'm not convinced. If you're a rider, freedom fighter, cloud excited, then let's do this. We can make one big united, middle finger to the U.S. Give me the bravest and the truest, fuck the hippest and the coolest. We gon' spark this revolution and cross this up at the duelist. Put your foot down if you look down on this criminal system. Put your book down and get shook down like my niggas in prison. Don't be condemning and condoning their actions in one sentence. But keep your mind, you decide, is you a patriot or a menace to society? To riot or sit by quietly. But don't pull out the flag and try to say you gon' ride with me. You flip flop like hip hop, I don't get locked in that trick box. You get got like big and pop, shit's got to stop. I am the people, not the big. I repeat after prayer, so please blow my brains out if I ever forget. I'm up the air. I'm down with the numbers and the shakers and the ex henny drinkers, the non smokers, the health advocates, the non voters, the young bloods in the hood training like soldiers. I'm on the side of the tracks with the hood guards, the little child and the color inside the lodges. I don't ride the fence, I cultivate my strength. Cause if it ain't about power, it don't make sense. I've been down, I'm pretty down since beating peace of brown pride. The black power make RBG. A OG told me choose battles wisely. Then he struggled. Don't forget your children and your wife. If you don't see me on the podium, teaching it. And every day I hope my every action is teaching it. Cause revolution is a process. It's not a speech or a panel. But fight off the corner you can handle. <laughs> Shots in Palestina, from todos los estudiantes por educación gratuita. I'm with workers uprising and the right to unionize. We ain't crossed the border, so you better legalize. I'm with La Vega del Bronx. I'm still with Vito Toro, cause gentrification is polluting my borough. So grown never, so grown forever. Decolonize the block, make your neighborhood better. I ain't down with the rich, I'm more rich, you Perez. Don't talk to grand juries or cooperate with feds. I'm with students, doctors, janitors, teachers. We ain't living wages, but they don't believe us. Monida, Barreto, Spoffin, Hunts Point, my point, my I love, we join forces, throwing our deck, the ex. Taking over buildings, right with the ass for the children. Politics is sickness, streets express symptoms. Gotta put it quickness, big business gives them. Scholars play the simple tin, fools play with wisdom. Who will stand and fight back? Who will play the victim? Trials and tribulations, inches, generations. Stolen history and outsourced innovation. Battle Tower fell, tribes are at war. The battle score is not represented in the score of the game's fix. Most of the faces the name switch. Credit stolen for art, science, religion, language, technology, philosophy, and with strangers. They paid in Haitian for the knowledge of the ancients. Power in words, actions, guns, swords. Ain't half as brown for raised with young lords. Side one sickness, one cure, one love, one blood, one world, one war. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Rupa Maria, and I'm speaking to you today from 
um, the territory of Huchin, Ohlone territory, what is now called Oakland, California, what was Huchin for several thousand years here. I just wanted to acknowledge my ancestors and my ancestors and the ancestors of this land um, for providing me all I need to do this um, very important work that is ahead of us today. I am an associate professor of medicine at UCSF in the division of hospital medicine. I wanted to thank UCSF for their support today for um, putting together the platform to allow us to share this important work. Um, and I'm also a, a musician um, who has been deeply involved in um, social struggles around the world with my music, and that has allowed me a really unique opportunity to translate my clinical skills into direct action. And I'm going to introduce my friend here, Noah. Why not? Hello, uh, my name is Noah Morris. I'm coming from occupied Tutelo and Monacan territory uh, in South Central Appalachia. Um, I am a street medic of just shy of 20 years, uh, a retired EMT of 14 years, and presently a practicing acupuncturist. So we do this work today um, in the spirit of lifting the lives of those who have passed from police violence and their families. Um, specifically here in the Bay Area, I just want to say the names of um, these individuals who have really shaped my life and understanding as a physician um, and to broaden my scope of healing as we're gonna talk about today. Um, so we have Alex Nieto, we have Oscar Grant, Luis Gongorapat, Maria Woods, Shalim Tindall, Jessica Nelson Williams. There are so many um, who have died of police violence um, around our country and in the legacy of um, colonial violence um, since the occupation of this land. And so it's important to situate this, what we're experiencing today in this historical context so we can understand how to best move forward. So when people use their bodies as tools um, of social change, our act as accompaniment as healthcare professionals can support and protect those bodies as they stand up for their right to health and justice. We will be discussing today how to translate your valuable clinical skills from the arena where you are comfortable to the place of intense suffering right now, which is our society. Um, so we are all healers, and we will be talking about how to amplify the healing work that we do. When we bring our professional gravitas and skills to the streets, we are moving the needle more urgently to alleviate the intense social malaise caused by racist police violence. Uh, modern day street medics, we, uh, we trace our history back to uh, 1936 and the American Medical Bureau that was organized by Dr. Edward Barsky. See, these recruited doctors, dentists, nurses, ambulance drivers to join the Lincoln Brigades who deployed in solidarity uh, with Republican Spain. Uh, fast forward, you see us turning up at uh, the uprising at Stonewall. Yeah, we have medic elders who uh, provided support during the Wounded Knee occupation. And even one who uh, was shot during that occupation. Uh, you know, continuing forward, we were instrumental in supporting uh, ACT UP as well as other organizations uh, in their direct action campaigns. Uh, and fast forwarding even further, we were the founders of the Common Ground Health Clinic in New Orleans, the first civilian run clinic operated after uh, Hurricane Katrina, which is still in operation as a federally qualified health center. Uh, presently, we see street medics uh, around the world uh, working in alliance with uh, uh, movements fighting for greater egalitarian societies. Presently, medics around the country are helping and treating grievous injuries uh, in the wake of the George Floyd uprising. So today, um, I'm, we're gonna run through these objectives, but I also just wanna let you know, we have the Q&A active for everybody. We, have, um, we had over 5,000 people respond for this training. We will be recording this and um, uploading it to the Do No Harm Coalition uh, YouTube channel. So subscribe there if you're interested, you'll get notified when it's uploaded in the coming days. We want this information shared widely. We will be um, having a 30 minute Q&A session at the end. Um, we have Mike Sweeney working with us, um, who is um, helping us, another Do No Harm Coalition member who's gonna help us 
go through the questions. So your questions will get answered. Thank you for participating. So today what we wanna do is um, have you walk away understanding that police violence is a public health crisis. We want you to learn how to prepare for street medic work and how to safely assess the field and act in a way that is safe for yourself and your patients. To become familiar with police weaponry um, and common injuries that you'll see and to grow the community of engaged professionals, um, healthcare professionals who are committed to changing the structures that are um, injuring our patients. We are assuming that your BLS and first aid um, like trained and we won't be covering these things. We're also assuming that you have some level of clinical skill that you're engaged in clinical work. Um, so we are going to be um, working to translate your skills into a different setting. As an overview of our presentation, first we'll discuss the data around police violence. Then we'll talk about preparation for street medicine, um, a very important topic of situational awareness. Then we'll take a five minute break where I'll, um, where I'll share some of my music with you. Um, we'll come back and discuss police weapons and common injury patterns um, and how you can care for yourself after um, your service, as well as share some other resources and then open it up to a QA. a So in um, 2018, the American Public Health Association declared um, law enforcement violence as a public health threat. Not only is it um, a threat to the person who experiences the violence, but to the people who witness it and um, the communities that endure it, um, as well as what we're seeing right now, the erosion of civic structures um, when, the, um, when the contract of good governance is violated um, by this violence. Um, this data I'm sharing right now is from Mapping Police Violence, which is an excellent website that's culling um, data around um, the country right now. Um, and as you can see, there were only 27 days in 2019 where the police did not kill somebody. Um, in spite of all the dialogue and all the press and all the um, attempt at reformations of police departments, we see that there has been very little that has moved the needle on the number of people that are killed by police. When I look at this graph, I think not only, again, of the individual, but the ripple effect that that um, killed individual has, um, the murder has on the entire community and the health of that community. Again, from mapping police violence, we see here this in prior years, um, the, these disparities were even more intense. Um, but we see here that police um, are more likely to kill, three times more likely to kill a black person um, than a white person. Um, and you can also see that it's not about, you know, how violent your city is. So this, this data here shows that regardless of how, um, how violent, like even extremely violent cities have lower police um, killing rates compared to um, maybe less violent cities. So it's about the culture of um, the police department. There are several police departments around our country that kill black men at higher rates than the US murder rate. This is alarming. This um, study came out of Michigan um, last year, which showed that the risk of being killed by police um, use of force in the United States um, was the sixth leading cause of death for young black men. So this black men in their 20s and 30s, um, which is highly alarming. They also showed that the lifetime risk um, of being killed by police um, was much higher for indigenous people, um, African-Americans and Latinx people. One of the main problems and the re-traumatizing experiences for the community is that of all these killings, very, very, it's very rare for there to be any accountability or justice. In 2016, the community amount around Mario Woods, the Justice for Mario Woods Coalition, as well as the family of Mario Woods, asked me to conduct a research study. So I'm not a researcher um, and um, I am completely committed to taking care of my community. So I agreed. And their research question they posed to me is, could you design a study that shows what happens to our health? If a police killing is the wound and the medicine is justice, what happens when the medicine is withheld from us? And so I worked with Dr. Sonia McKenzie, who is a um, researcher at Santa Clara University, as well as Liz Croboth from San Francisco um, State, as well as um, students from UC Berkeley to conduct this justice study. We're wrapping up the um, review of the data right now, and we'll be writing up our findings um, within the next month. Um, so what we found is that 
everyone basically is traumatized um, with um, having experienced or witnessed police violence with black and brown um, people most impacted. Um, especially African Americans who witnessed police violence had um, higher rates of poor health, self-related self -related poor health. We also see that even though every race is traumatized, the areas of life that are impacted um, most impact people of color compared to white folks. And why this is important is because we know that exposure to trauma and being re-traumatized um, leads to chronic stress. And chronic stress, we are now understanding further, leads to chronic low-grade inflammation. Many of the diseases that we treat in the hospital um, at the end stage are diseases that have at their base a degree of low-grade inflammation. And so it makes me wonder as a clinician how much police violence is contributing to the, um, to the experience of um, the disproportionate rates of suffering from these diseases from especially Black and Latino communities and Indigenous communities. Looking at COVID, um, this, this data becomes actually more important um, as we know that um, inflammation, under, underlying um, low-grade inflammation is potentiating the expression of the disease. So medical professionals in the streets really legitimize um, the, um, the struggle of people who see this as an impediment to their health, and we're, we're seeing those voices rise all over the country. Um, I'm going to refer you, I've included in this slide, which will be available as a PDF, we'll upload to the Do No Harm Coalition website, um, a link to the APHA um, policy statement on police violence. There's a lot of great people doing um, research around this issue around the country. Uh, one of the other needs for uh, medical professionals to show our solidarity on the streets is because during police riots, uh, traditional EMS is not allowed to respond into protest situations unless police deem that situation secure. So this has prevented and caused exacerbation of injuries at protests around the country and around the world. Uh, this was one of the main reasons emergency medical or street medics started doing what we do uh, because you know EMS will not go there. And we'll talk later about how you may need to evacuate your patients out of the protest area to be able to get them to EMS transport. I also think it's important as a respectful way of addressing diversity of tactics. Uh, as a Lakota matriarch, uh, Deborah White Plume has taught me, the, uh, there's a painting of the Battle of Greasy Grass, the Battle of Low Big Horde, where in the near focus is a young Lakota warrior who's holding just fresh horses, watching the battle go on. Uh, and she points out, that, that that brave warrior is just as necessary as every single warrior out actively fighting the cavalry because him holding the fresh horses for those warriors to switch out is just as necessary as those warriors going back out to battle. Uh, as in that analogy, uh, street medics, radical journalists, radical lawyers are people who come out, people who share food with demonstrators. It is not just the people in the street we see. And so it's this broad coalition, this broad faceted that make us strong. Um, now we're going to talk about some preparations uh, you can make before uh, uh, going out into the streets. Um, first, you want to identify someone who won't be going with you. Uh, uh, to make sure that they are a point of contact, they uh, know your legal information, they might be holding some bail money for you if you, you inadvertently end up arrested. Uh, they know if you have medical conditions or if your cat or dog needs to be fed, your plant needs to be watered, your boss needs to be called, all that good stuff. You want someone to have your back back home. Oftentimes in these larger mobilizations, the National Lawyer Guild or Grassroots Legal Aid will provide legal support. Uh, those phone numbers will be made based on locality, uh, and it's advised to use a Sharpie or other permanent marker to write that on places in your body. Usually, you want to write that in at least two places on your body, preferably places that are not readily identifiable or visible because people have been arrested simply for having a legal support number written on their arm. Buddy systems. Buddies save lives. This is true in frontline healthcare, in EMS work, in the military. He, if you're hiking, you want a buddy. He, one of the best ways to figure out if uh, uh, the person you want to go to the protest with is appropriate 
is using this tool right here that we have up, Rival. Speaks about the roles. Is someone going to be the primary treater? Is someone going to primarily be coordinating maps or uh, intelligence that may be coming through Twitter or other avenues? Uh, IDs. Are we going to be carrying our IDs? What are our identities? Are we going out marked very clearly as uh, medical professionals in nearly our work uniforms? Or are we going out dressed uh, more like the average demonstrators so we don't get targeted? Vulnerabilities. Do you have any vulnerabilities your buddy should be aware of? Are you allergic to bees? Do you have a bad knee or bad ankle? Are you terrified of dogs? Do you have asthma? These are vulnerabilities y'all should check in with to see whether or not you know, Oh, you can support each other and uh, your goals uh, uh, are compatible. Which brings us to A, aspirations. What are we trying to get done? Are we trying to carry just tons of water out there? It's a hot day. The best use we can do is preventative medicine. We're going to make sure everyone stays hydrated. Cool. Are we going to try and be gas masked, helmeted, ready to dive in there and save uh, uh, demonstrators who've been critically injured? If you don't have the same plan, if someone's planning on running towards the chaos and someone's planning on going home if there's chaos, you're probably not going to be good buddies. You should talk to someone else. Loose ends. What else might come up? You know, I can only be out till 2 a.m. because, like, that's when my babysitter's done. So if things look like it's going to be hard to go home, we're going to have to go home early. It's like my babysitter, not going to do it. Someone needs to, like, feed my cats. Someone needs to call my partner and tell them that, like, I'm in trouble. What are those loose ends that might come up? Um, ideally, in that buddy system um, in the streets, I know lots of y'all are medical professionals, uh, and you're usually used to working uh, in calmer environments where you can wander away. You don't need the buddy system. But in these situations, we want to be just about in hand-holding distance. Uh, if there's pushy, pushy, shovey, shovey going on, you want to be holding on to your buddy's uh, backpack or vest or shirt collar or so y'all don't get separated. Y'all want a, a medic without their buddy in the streets is, you know, a medic who's likely going to jail. It's also important as medical professionals that we understand the Good Samaritan laws. Uh, I'm going to put a disclaimer right here. I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. Check your local ordinances on this but there are several generalities that are pretty universal in Good Samaritan laws uh, uh, across the country in the U.S. As first is that you are not uh, expecting uh, compensation. You're not being paid, uh, that you are not treating outside your scope of practice. Uh, so this usually for many of us restricts it to BLS interventions uh, uh, and that you do not abandon your patient. Uh, so that goes to uh, transfer of care and transferring care only to uh, people who are equally or greater trained than yourself. So mostly with these Good Samaritan laws, these help keep uh, most medical workers safe from any liability. And there's never been any instance that I'm aware of of a street medic being uh, litigated against for care they've provided during uh, contest. Uh, conflictual uh, uh, protests or injuries that have been treated in those situations. Uh, you got to decide again, looking at your aspirations, are you going to be more of a frontline medic or are you going to uh, uh, be more of a street clinician than a street medic? Like street clinicians are, are folks who may be setting up a static position in a park or maybe an alley or a friendly business that allows them to do uh, uh, not just first aid, but secondary care, take better time with splinting, better time with assessing injuries, longer with decontamination. Our frontline medics are usually going to be near the front line, usually within 50 feet of the frontline protesters. There's, they're going to be the ones who are more likely going to help facilitate the transport of patients out of tear gas, out of a, a, a conflict situation with uh, specific carries uh, and able to uh, bring them to those more static positions, to the, those areas of continuity of care, so to speak. Uh, and these are both important. This is why uh, it's good to check in before things get all crazy. It's good to know a, a rival just for your body system, but if you're working in a bigger group, who's going to be where? Who's going to be uh, with y'all in the front? Who's going to be with y'all in the back? 
because you're going to pack your kits pretty differently for this. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there and let Rupa start uh, discussing uh, how you can outfit yourself. Thank you, Noah. Um, so I tend to be, I have two young children. I have to show up at work, can't get arrested. Um, I don't really want to get arrested. Um, I wrote a song about that actually. Um, and, and so for me, my, um, there's no right and wrong about how you participate as a medical provider, um, whether you're working directly with uh, more frontline street medics, people like Mo Noah who had that experience, or whether you're creating a makeshift clinic um, farther beyond or in a static location so that you can help with triaging, getting people out and then out to EMS if needed. Um, for myself, I prefer that more static position um, for one reason, because it's what I'm used to in, as a, uh, it's where I'm most effective. Um, and, and um, yeah, so it's just finding where your comfort is and finding where your utility is, how you can best serve, and then partnering with people who have different skill sets. Like I don't have Noah's skill set, so partnering with him at Standing Rock was um, very powerful um, and with all the frontline medics. So this is a, um, I'm going to talk about um, what to wear. So this is a picture of a Hong Kong uh, protester showing us his gear, um, his or her gear. And it's um, a really, um, you know, this is a, when things are going to be ugly, this is what you want to do. Um, so you want to be wearing, um, you know, full coverage um, clothes because the chemicals, uh, weapons that are used are skin irritants. Um, you could consider wearing scrubs and your lab coat, um, symbols of our profession, which I think, like I said, um, can help the, the visualization, I think, of our society and also the police that there are medical professionals out there um, assisting. Um, but you want to be nimble. You want to be wearing shoes you can really run in. Um, this is COVID, um, so I would recommend all medical providers wear a 95 mask. Um, in, if you're going to be in a dicey situation, you might want to wear a full face covering um, to, avoid, um, to avoid facial recognition technology. Some people um, advise bringing your badge in your pocket in case you get accosted or stopped by the police that you can show that you are a medical professional there in service of people. Um, there is also a recommendation to consider wearing heat resistant gloves or having them available in case there is, um, you know, some of the stun grenades or canisters that are um, projected towards you. Um, what not to wear is ear, our contact lenses um, and makeup. So goggles, if you're highly burned so that you don't, um, so that you remain effective in the cloud of um, tear gas, as well as a, um, a helmet um, to avoid being bludgeoned, um, which sadly happens more frequently. What to bring? Um, so um, that again depends on where you're going to be. So no, you want to talk about this? Yeah. So especially if you're going to be uh, up near the front where you're likely going to be dealing with a lot more just eye flushes, quick kind of treat them and street them situations or uh, stabilize and move them to continuity of care. Uh, you don't really need the broadest uh, diversity of supplies. You're going to want to have loads and loads of gloves, especially now because we're seeing lots of people doing eye flushes, especially in the time of COVID. We want to be changing those gloves in between uh, uh, every single eye flush. Um, you know, our masks and our personal protective equipment. We want to have either our respirator, uh, gas mask, whatever you feel comfortable with, and we can uh, speak elsewhere uh, to, to specifics on, on gas masks and stuff like that. Uh, you want to have just like loads and loads of simple bandages for, for bleeding control, uh, you know, a change of clothes. Uh, tied up in a bag so when you leave you can like change out of your gear so you're not wandering around in chemical weapons all day. Um, some light snacks and like loads and loads of water, as much water as you can carry, um, um, both for yourself and for being able to do eye flushes. Certainly in some of these situations, uh, uh, you know, it can be hard to resupply or refill water bottles. Um, you want a good water bottle uh, uh, with a nice good sports top uh, for your eye flushing and a separate container for your uh, uh, drinking water. Uh, 
if you're going to be doing more of the clinical um, situation, aside from just the, the kind of PPE, the, uh, which is kind of some basic list we have here, here uh, you know, at the clinical situation, you can, can have some more of the, uh, what we sometimes call authority drag. You know, you're in your lab coat, you're in your scrubs, you're in uniform. Or um, uh, signs clearly marking the area as a medic station. Um, you know, uh, this person no protective equipment. Uh, these are all great things uh, uh, to have. Uh, I would even include a helmet these days, since we're seeing a lot of headshots from law enforcement uh, uh, with their rubber bullets and kinetic rounds. Um, for our decontamination, uh, at some of these situations, we'll have a real static uh, a clinic site that we'll set up. And usually outside, we'll set up a decontamination station that'll have uh, changes of clothes uh, and cold water, uh, maylots, different things to remove chemical weapons from uh, the surface of the skin to decontaminate people before we move them into indoor facilities, because we don't want to contaminate those indoor treatment spaces. Uh, just like many of you who might work in emergency departments, you sometimes have to send someone through a decon room before they come in to be treated. Uh, same setting for, for our field clinics, um, especially if our field clinic is in a church or something. Don't want don't to contaminate the church anymore. Um, Pseudicon wipes. Uh, Pseudicon wipes are a commercially available product that's largely used by law enforcement. Uh, we kindly had a organic chemist who uh, reverse engineered it for us. And so we have the recipe, which is included later in the PowerPoint. Uh, so you can make these your own and that's a lot cheaper. Um, as for decontamination, one of the other good things to do is not get it on you. So having either like a, a quick poncho, uh, one of those pocket ponchos to be able to put on yourself so that uh, your base layer doesn't get uh, as contaminated with weapons to, you know, get rid of that, bundle it up, ditch it somewhere in a trash can uh, for later. Um, especially if you're being a, a clinician, you're going to more likely see some common medical al uh, ailments that may crop up in these situations. Uh, I'm going to let Rupa speak to some of the basic medications you may want to have on hand there. Yes, so some basic meds that we can carry that can be useful in the street, um, in addition to cough drops, which I was very grateful for um, when, when I've been in these situations. Um, it's just to hand people. People are usually shouting um, for hours at these events. Um, is to have some glucose tabs for diabetics, um, to have some NSAIDs and Tylenol available, definitely Narcan on hand. EpiPen could come in really handy. Um, activated charcoal can also come in handy. Nitro tabs and aspirin. Um, liquid Benadryl um, can also be handy if we're dealing with anaphylaxis in the field um, before EMS comes. And then some people are, um, I've worked like Noah uh, now, and um, I've worked with some licensed acupuncturists who um, will be able to do some acupuncture um, in the field, especially around um, trauma and stress as people um, as people are um, being treated. Um, in terms of wound care, a sort of a, a more souped up uh, first aid kit we can, we can bring. Um, so gauze, ace wraps, uh, bandage wraps, ABDs, tourniquets. Um, I think it's helpful to have some saline with a 50cc syringe to irrigate uh, wounds, some betadine um, swabs, some alcohol swabs, Dermabond, I think there's an over-the-counter variety you can get. Um, just want to emphasize that's not super glue, even though they're chemically very similar. Um, it's specifically for skin. Um, bringing some triple antibiotic ointment is good. Um, some Band-Aids and if you can get a, a cold pack. These are all kinds of things that will be more helpful um, um, in, the, in the back line. Noah, do you want to talk about personal personal items? Yeah, uh, so personal items. Uh, you know, you want your own like things to help keep you you uh, happy, healthy, and calm. So any favored, you know, tinctures, aromatherapy stuff you make do. Uh, hand sanitizer. We gotta keep our paws washed. Um, 
if you're someone who menstruates, we recommend uh, not using tampons because there's been instances of chemical weapons wicking with the tampons, but things like Diva cups, keepers, um, those sorts of device or menstrual pads seem to be fine uh, and don't carry that same danger of wicking chemical weapons. Uh, baby wipes, you know, if you're out kind of, many of y'all work long shifts in sometimes hot conditions, you know the benefit of a nice baby wipe uh, washed out for yourself uh, uh, to refresh yourself in, in hard times. Uh, uh, again, if you're out in a, a crazy situation, a wild situation like we're seeing in some cities, uh, you might want to consider taking an anti-diarrheal uh, when you suddenly realize you've got to poop and there are riot police pushing you and tear gas over here and patients in front of you, that's a really terrible time to have to poop, especially if there are no businesses uh, open anymore that will let you in to use the restroom. Uh, so, so considering uh, uh, doing that as a uh, personal com comfort option. Um, cough drops, any other snacks? I personally, if it's colder weather, really like candy ginger. Uh, to help keep me warm. A lot of medics will uh, carry and chew on uh, a Chinese licorice root because it's kind of good for soothing the, the nervous system uh, and the myelin sheathing and it helps uh, uh, minimize the uh, uh, frayed nerves, uh, so to speak. Um, other kind of more diagnostic gear you may want if you're gonna be more of the street clinician, you're gonna be more interested in having your BP cuff uh, you're going to want to uh, uh, have a stethoscope for listening to breath sounds, glucometers. We got lots of folks who, you know, might have ended up marching and marching all day and didn't get to uh, 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 their snacks on time. So, you know, we want to make sure that the we got a glucometer, check the blood sugar. Again, with COVID uh, and tear gas and the potentiation for reactional asthma uh, to the chemical irritants, we want to pulse ox. Um, and these sorts of other diagnostic equipment can be uh, more useful uh, uh, if you're going to be in a more static street clinician role. Uh, I'll also say street clinicians have known to just like set up camp on park benches and like set up space and just the crowd kind of made the walls for them. Uh, so it's uh, uh, important to adapt to your surroundings. Up here is the uh, recipe for the Sudicon. Uh, this creates a liquid that you can soak uh, gauze pads or paper towels in and put in Ziploc bags so you have individual units uh, so you don't potentially mix it up with your eye flush or any other liquids you may be carrying. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Noah. Um, we're now going to, and we see there's uh, many, many questions, so we're excited we're going to leave a good half hour to address the, the, the questions. So we're now going to review this concept of situational awareness. Um, so this is how I'm used to practicing in a static physical setting. I work as a hospitalist at UCSF. These are um, people treating COVID patients. Um, this is a stock photo. Actually, this one was from um, the New York Times. Um, so I'm used to being in a static physical setting um, where um, there are known resources, there are known concerns for patient safety, and also relatively known concerns for my um, my personal safety as well as the patient safety. So the 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 controlled environment of the hospital setting is something that I'm I'm very used to and I'm I'm very comfortable with. Um, this is a very different situation and can um, provide, you know, it can be very anxiety producing for someone like me who's used to a static situation. The reason we think this training is useful is that being, um, sharing this information with what to expect can help you plan better how to situate yourself and how to prepare. So in the street setting, the, the setting is constantly fluid. And it's constantly fluid in intensity. So it can go from being calm to chaotic in seconds. There's also shifting resources. So, you know, you're someone who had um, one of the medic team groups that had a certain thing might be, you know, walking away or have been picked up by the police. So you don't necessarily have all the things that you wish you would um, at your disposal. That's why it's important to prepare as best you can, um, depending on where you're gonna be positioning yourself. Concerns for the patient and concerns for yourself are also major issues here because 
um, it's not that you're just focused on the patient, which you can do in a hospital. Um, you have to focus on the surroundings at the same time um, because those will pose constant threats to your physical safety and the, um, the patient's physical safety. And that is probably um, the biggest place of training um, that, that you can, you know, just be the biggest difference, I'd say, for us as medical professionals. You can start now by practicing your peripheral awareness. So even if you're not on the streets or not at um, an event, you can start by, um, you know, walking down a hospital ward or your clinic setting and just trying to practice what's in your periphery, being constantly aware of where someone's going, what they're wearing, trying to look at a situation, say, okay, how many nurses are here? How many patients? What are the different people here? Here, um, so that you're constantly learning how to look at something and read it immediately. Um, so that's a skill that takes time to develop, but it's 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 easy to develop once once you know that you need it. Um, so Noah is going to talk a little bit more about situational awareness. Yeah. So in our role as street medics, we kind of uh, have to start thinking of ourselves as professional observers. We want to uh, be reading uh, not just the, the situation in the immediacy, but look at what folks are prepared for. Are the police wearing, you know, shorts and t-shirts, no helmets, no riot gear, or are they all dressed for, you know, combat situation, full gas mask, helmets, heavy armor? Uh, and what are the protesters? You know, what are they doing? Thing. Are they, you know, walking, chanting, you know, high-spirited, peaceful? Are people, you know, uh, uh, pissed off? Are people, you know, jubilant? What's the spirit of the crowd? Um, we need to be constantly kind of observing this for change, you know. So here are some examples of a peace vigil and a second line style protest in New Orleans that uh, are generally very safe. You know, the crowd's jubilant or solemn. Uh, uh, there's a big diverse crowd. You know, this one had like a police escort. Um, here we start seeing situations where like, you don't see any gas, you don't see any clubs, but clearly there's some crowd crunch, some pushy, pushy, shovey, shovey starting to happen. And you don't want to be in the middle of the crowd as a medic right in here. These might be patient, future patients and you don't want to become a future patient. And you know, Oh, uh, some of our first check-ins, one, am I safe? Two, is my buddy safe? You know, three, then we start looking outward. Um, you know, and this fluid nature can change quickly. You know, uh, uh, moments before this picture was taken, this whole intersection was filled with people. This is what's left after a lot of tear gas, rubber bullets, and uh, kinetic munitions were deployed with one individual left kneeling. So from this picture, all you see is, you know, maybe the road runner just went out of frame uh, after robbing this guy. You don't know. Where are the cops? Where are the protesters? We can't see any of this. Uh, so if we're not looking around, if we have this sort of tunnel vision that the media can get on like the action, then we're going to uh, fail to be able to keep ourselves safe in this uh, fluid dynamic situation. And we're going to fail to be looking for our patients. You know, where do the patients go? Oh, where are our quiet patients? You know, these quiet patients, you know, the asthma patient who got tear gassed and hit in the chest with a tear gas canister isn't going to be the people calling for medic. They're going to be the one curled up next to a car trying to breathe. Uh, so it's important, especially if you're choosing to be in, in closer to the action, that as the crowd evacuates or pulls back from police violence, medics are slow in that retreat and almost cover that retreat so the injured or the stragglers who may be injured at the end do not get targeted, do not get left uh, wounded laying out there uh, uh, without care. Um, so we want to position ourselves for this kind of optimal uh, response. And we want to look at some of these kind of basic police tactics. These are not you know, new cutting age tactics. These are very old tactics that have been used, uh, some of them for centuries. Uh, and it, gaining simple understandings of some of these tactics, you can see where police were loaded, uh, uh, lining up to attack a crowd. Uh, here we see, you know, a crowd may be marching. They might, you know, be at the, the city hall or whatever, or the police station facing it. 
and then more police are brought in behind them to kettle them and catch them all or chase them off to the either other side. Um, you'll also see this, you know, they'll try and pinch people in. They'll, they'll try and come down opposite ends of a block to try and force people, uh, you know, in this situation, they're coming from the east and the west and they want people to move, you know, north and south out of that area. Uh, um, you can go to the next slide, Rupa. Uh, encirclement, this is kettling. You know, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, we see this, we saw this in DC the other night where they push people into residential neighborhoods to try and uh, mass arrest people, so get them surrounded and arrest as many people. We saw this in Chicago where they uh, lifted the bridges before, right before curfew so people couldn't leave and they arrested over a thousand people. Uh, this kind of kettling uh, we need to be aware of and, and be mindful of, especially, you know, a lot of folks here, I'm sure I know have medical licenses that may or may not uh, hold up to uh, criminal charges. Uh, so this is like, if you see these things starting to happen is when you and your buddy got to choose whether you stay or go um, and what your, where, where your situation is. There's excellent footage of medics treating from uh, the end of Occupy Wall Street as the police surrounded them with other medics throwing their uh, medic kits over the police into the medics treating inside because they were running out of gear. Uh, so again, there's a uh, place for us everywhere. Barricades. Barricades are awesome in my opinion. They're like a public health thing. They help prevent injuries. Um, static barricades uh, help really uh, uh, minimize the injuries from kinetic attacks like rubber bullets uh, or bean bag rounds. Uh, and so a smaller number of people can hold a space, especially if there's a choke point there too. Um, police will also use these same techniques. Yeah, uh, they will move in police vehicles so they can, you know, make a, a choke point so so people can't continue down uh, the street without passing a small group. This is a way a small group can hold a lot more ground and hold off a much bigger group. Um, if you see the police forming up into a big triangle, you're probably going to want to step to the side because they're about to rush in and go through this whole crowd and then they're going to spread out and grab and try and drag as many folks back within their line for arrest teams. Um, if folks just run away, then you just see them running down the street chasing a big crowd and their formation will break up. Uh, but this is a primary attack formation when the police are going to rush a crowd. Uh, this is, uh, shows some good example of covering an escape. You want to be this person, but this group uh, right here of the last four may be a group of medics slowly retreating with injured people so, uh, or keeping an eye on this last potential patient we have uh, who's still standing off while others are able to, to move away to safety from the advancing line. So um, when you encounter someone who needs help, um, the same that we encounter in clinical medicine obviously apply. You approach a patient when it's safe for you to approach. You introduce yourself and you are also very honest about your level of skill, so who you are, what, what role you play, and then you ask for permission to help them. And this is actually a very important um, thing. I know it's, you know, when you see someone traumatized, you might assume that everyone wants your help. Um, it's also important to remember that um, many people in these movements right now struggling for their own health, um, black, brown, and indigenous community, the medical community hasn't always been their best friend. Um, and so there might be a degree of skepticism or not wanting you to help. Um, so getting that clarity um, introducing clearly who you are, why you're there, and um, asking for permission to help is extremely important. 
then you're going to explain what you're going to do. Um, so if you see that they've been, you know, like with this picture, um, they might have just been sprayed with uh, pepper spray that you're going to help wash out their eyes and you're going to explain what you're going to use and how you're going to do it. And then as quickly as you can, after treating them appropriately and stabilizing them, you're going to move them to the next level of care. You're going to get them out of um, where they are, um, get them safe and move them on. Really important tips um, to consider and what I've really loved and see as in this work as a lifetime of learning for myself is the deep place of cultural humility um, that street medicine offers um, medically trained professionals, like physicians especially, to really understand the colonial roots of um, Western medicine, um, how Western medicine developed at the same time as colonial expansion, and was often used as a justification of colonization of um, indigenous lands um, from Africa to India to um, Turtle Island here. And so understanding that um, really can shift and change how you practice to more intensely center patients and their histories um, and their um, social context. Um, so this is what um, many of us in this work are calling decolonizing medicine. This is part of the work of decolonizing medicine to take the amazing training and tools and gifts of Western science and what we are learning and to meld them with practices from indigenous cultures um, in places that have greater sense of cultural humility to create a, a new way of practicing. When you're out there, you should assume trauma. So especially right now, many black and brown people are traumatized by what they've seen. Um, they're traumatized by the history of oppression. Again, policing started um, as a way to return runaway slaves and to keep indigenous people under control. And so the legacy of police violence for these communities, um, especially when you think of also Latinx communities and ICE raids and you know, putting children in cages, these are all very traumatic experiences for these communities. So it's important when you're there to understand that you're dealing with people who are highly traumatized um, by prior events and then if in the protest they've then encountered police violence themselves, they're re-traumatized. So we have several layers of historical and current um, trauma. So it's really important to practice trauma-informed care. Um, if you don't know about this, you can, you can read about it, but this is um, absolutely essential in this work that we're doing. Next thing I just wanna say is, um, it goes along with humility, is don't assume you're in charge. So Noah um, has, way more years in street medicine than I do. I have way more years in the hospital. If you were to walk into the hospital and start ordering people around, I'd tell them to sit down and shut up. And that's what he tells me if I do the same on the street. So it's about context. I'm not in charge there, I'm there to learn. And I'm um, there to learn what best ways I can translate my clinical skills. And when you can work in partnership, make friends with street medics, um, make friends with other people doing this work, um, you will learn immensely quickly. And also it will be a rewarding kind of learning that you can then bring back into your work in the hospital and in the clinic. This will serve you in how you treat people. Um, I believe if everyone in medicine had the opportunity to work with communities struggling for health and justice in this way, we might not see the same level of um, medical racism continuing in our own clinical spaces. So this is deeply anti-racist work and um, it's a part of a lifelong journey for us. And I'll just end this section. Actually, Noah, maybe you can end this section because you're the one who told me this expression to lead by following. He told me this at Standing Rock. Uh, yeah. It's a, a saying that we took to heart down in New Orleans uh, when we were doing our immediate response. It's a, a phrase that, uh, as far as I'm aware, comes from the Zapatista communities, and it's to lead by following. Um, we're, we're going to help people. You know, they're not necessarily seeking our care in the streets. We, we're not necessarily of the communities being affected. We're coming to show our solidarity so we have to lead by asking, what is it you want us to do? You know, like many things, you know, some street medics who show up at, like ready for like war, 
when it's a vigil, is it going to really calm people down? What do the medics know that we don't know? You got to ask your local organizers, ask your community, you know, what it is, what level of engagement you want from the medics. Uh, and you, you follow that. You know, we don't, um, we're not doctors, we're not nurses out in the street. You know, we don't have anyone at the front of the building getting informed consents for us. Everything we do, we have to engage our patients in informed consent all the way through it. We don't get a quick sign off and it goes in their chart. Yeah, you know, we're restoring people's agency to continue to be brave in the streets is what is often asked of us. And so we follow the lead of those brave folks who are out there taking risks, trying to create this better world. Uh, and we follow their leadership. Uh, uh, and that's how we know to be brave and how we can help as medical professionals is uh, uh, our leadership role as healthcare providers in society we can be powerfully uh, shown in solidarity situations. Saw a video of uh, a hospital in New York yesterday where the medical workers in their full PPE came out to applaud the George Floyd protesters who were marching by. That's the solidarity, that's the powerful things we can do when we work together, but we are not there to lead. As medics in the street, we're not there to tell people what to do. We're there to, to support the people who are there doing it. So with that, um, we're gonna take a little break. Um, this is the album cover from my last album, which came out in 2019. And um, the artwork is by a fabulous San Francisco artist, Mona Caron. Um, you can see on there of the individuals, there's my bandmates. Um, there's also San Francisco legend, Guillermo Gomez Peña, who co-wrote this Declaration of Human Rights um, with me that we're gonna share while we take our break. There's also a lonely matriarch, Karina Gould there offering um, a smudge. Um, I was just amazed how much this, this album cover looks like coronavirus. I just can't get over it. So we are gonna take a break, um, enjoy the music. We'll be back in about five minutes. Um, go to the bathroom, do what you need to do. All right. A declaration of human rights. From the older South a declaration of human rights. We are my love. We are the From the older From the my love. From 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 the older Everyone has 
has the right to occupy any abandoned building or empty public space for the purpose of building shelters and dwellings or simply making art without a permit. Everyone has the right to live without fear of being shot by the police, the border patrol, or citizen vigilantes. Everyone has the right to police the police instead of the police policing themselves. We have the right to an mental crisis to be treated with loving kindness and radical tenderness instead of pills, indifference, and jails. We have the right to live in the city of our choice without a militarized presence in times of peace. legitimacy and authority of any institution or entity that does not abide by this declaration of human rights, even if only in the realm of the natural. In the realm of the natural. <laughs> All right. Well, we hope you all, all right. are refreshed. Um, we are back. Wonderful. Um, so now we're going to be moving into our police weapons section. Uh, I'd like to prime that with saying that uh, overwhelmingly uh, what's in common with all these tactics and weapons that law enforcement chooses to use is that their common factor is they're trying to generate fear. And fear is their most powerful weapon. Uh, one of the main goals that street medics have, uh, we do lots of just participant protester health and safety trainings, which uh, teach people a lot of these same best practices y'all are hearing. Thing. So folks can uh, be informed and knowledgeable about what these weapons are capable of and how we can defend ourselves against them. Um, uh, street medics certainly operate with the understanding that knowledge is power. Uh, and so our goal is to help inoculate people, our trainees and uh, other street medics and brave protesters and protectors uh, to inoculate them against fear. 
the fear that these police movements uh, generate, the fear that is understandable when, you know, explosive devices and poison gas clouds and exploding things are happening around you uh, while there's shouts and noises going on. And so uh, all of that designed to overwhelm the senses and generate a fear flight response. They don't want, they, they don't want you to freeze. They don't want you to fight. They want you to run uh, when they deploy these weapons. They want you to be scared going out in the streets because they have these weapons. Um, if you're interested in a lot of the detailed ins and outs and specifications of a lot of these weapons, uh, the post up right now is the cover of an excellent zine that was made about 10 years ago uh, that goes into a lot of the very fine specifics, uh, uh, muzzle velocities of these various kinetic projectiles uh, and wattage and amperage of the various electric. Oops. Uh, and that is an excellent resource if you really want to know the ins and outs of this equipment. Uh, moving on to one of the more common things we're seeing uh, is OC spray, you know, tear gas. Uh, we we promote, yeah. You know, oh, sorry, pepper spray. Yeah, OC and pepper spray. Hey, uh, these are usually going to be uh, uh, hand deployed devices. Um, their active ingredient is. Uh, OC oleoresin capsicum, uh, mace is a synthetic variant of that. Um, you know, the symptoms wear off five to 20 minutes, uh, although folks can re kind of recontaminate themselves. Uh, you know, you want to help people stay calm. You yourself want to stay calm if you're the one, one uh, pepper sprayed. Um, you want to avoid kind of rubbing everything, uh, spreading it around. Uh, we advise a, a, an eye flush. Uh, with well-aimed direct pressure. I'm going to share a, a link to all y'all attendees uh, in the chat to an amazing TikTok video. Um, there you go. It's over on Facebook. Sorry, it's on Facebook. Uh, uh, I'm sure you can find it on TikTok if that's your uh, social media of choice. Um, but this is an excellent one-minute demonstration of a good way of approaching, a good way of doing this eye flush, a good basic eye flush, and the ability to do an eye flush on yourself is one of the main things you're gonna be using out there in the streets, aside from your ability to keep and spread calm. Uh, we also, uh, for these uh, chemical sprays, uh, UCSS has a study out that shows that um, antacids such as Maalox uh, can help for the skin. Um, I, I would avoid or uh, tell y'all to be mindful, especially on faces, if you're just pouring willy-nilly with that first initial pour, give a good wipe so that chemical weapons on the eyes don't get washed down from the forehead to the eyes or into the mouth. Uh, you know, uh, so, so rather than just, you know, when you're decontaminating someone's skin, a good wipe, first off, goes a long way to help get these chemical irritants off. And the last um, thing we wanted to correct was that we're, we, we don't, in, we don't, we don't advise putting milk in your eyes. Um, there's also some groups that like to use a liquid um, antacid water solution. Um, we think water is probably just the best way to go. Lots and lots of water. Another- I would also quickly add that uh, milk and uh, the liquid are white. Uh, and can be left as a marking indication on people of color, or people with more melanated skin, uh, marking them out for potential later arrest if they uh, stink of rotted milk or have white residue from the liquid antacid. So that's another reason to go with water uh, as a first choice option. So the next most common uh, or next common chemical weapon injury that we see is from CS gas or tear gas. Um, so CS gas um, is outlawed for use in international war by the Geneva Conventions, but somehow um, our police officers are um, entitled to use this upon the people um, in the United States. What worries me, and also I was just want to give a shout out to Dr. Peter Chin Hong because I saw his letter um, that right now with COVID, um, you know, CS gas, uh, this tear gas is going to cause a lot, a lot more problems. 
um, this is a solid um, substance that gets suspended in air through these canisters. It reacts with the water on your skin and it causes an instant burning within several seconds. Interestingly, this molecule, the, mo the active ingredient, um, activates the um, TRPA1 receptor, which is the same receptor that is activated by mustards and wasabi. It causes tearing of the eye, it causes spasming of the eyelids um, to the point where often people can't even open them. Reactive airways, asthma, cough, um, it also can cause bradycardia. Um, so again, with you have a bunch of people um, coughing right now in close proximity to each other, um, we're going to see a lot more COVID spreading. This is going to be a major aerosolization event. Um, in addition to that, um, there is concern that people who have been exposed to lots of tear gas um, will get develop some inflammation in their lungs. And we're, we're seeing that um, inflammation, chronic inflammation or inflammation can make the disease expression more intense. So that is just something to be aware of. Um, it might be, for those of us who stay in the hospital, a good clinical question is to ask a people in, in a protest where they've been exposed to CS gas lately. Um, symptoms usually abate when you get someone out of the area and get them into fresh air. Um, they usually last around 20 minutes. Again, you can flush the eyes with water or saline. An important thing is because this is a solid, like fine powder, um, you can remove your, um, uh, you should remove affected clothes. This is one good reason why you should always bring uh, an extra set of clothes with you. Um, also with this, we see injuries from the canisters themselves. So they're shot through these like guns um, and people have been hit in the head, they've been hit in the eye. Um, people have had um, pretty intense injuries from tear gas. What has been um, exciting and inspiring is watched, watching how the Hong Kong protesters um, last year were neutralizing these tear gas canisters. Um, they were wearing gloves, they grabbed a canister and stuck it in a um, water bottle where they closed it and shook it and basically um, put out the fire that um, it is um, igniting um, the substance in order to suspend it into the air. Um, there was some questioning about whether they, there was water in the water bottle um, and some of the Hong Kong protesters responded that it was actually mud. They had like a mud slurry in there. That they shook, um, put the canister in, closed the water bottle and shook it and then poured out this sludgy mess, um, which you know I think is an, an interesting approach. All right, kinetic inju injuries. We've been seeing a lot of these in the, the past week. Um, this is uh, one of the more common designs of rubber bullets. Uh, this is in fact technically called a sponge grenade. It's not actually made out of rubber. Or, um, but we've seen, you know, these have cracked people's skulls. These have cracked people's ribs. Uh, these are flying fast enough to to, uh, they've caused eye loss in several people. Um, similar uh, with other fired rounds, uh, the pepper ball gun, uh, back I forget uh, uh, when it was that Boston Red Sox won the, the championship, uh, but a young fan, Victoria Snellgrove, was killed by a police officer when she was shot in the eye at close range by a pepper ball gun. Um, which is, so a lot of eye injuries because a lot of these officers, a lot of these kinetic weapons like uh, rubber baton round, rounds, rubber bullets uh, are designed to actually be shot at the ground to, to skip off the ground and hit people in their lower extremities, causing injuries to incapacitate them so they can be arrested. What we've been seeing law enforcement doing instead, however, is they're targeting people's heads, which is outside of the protocol that they're supposed to be using in most departments. Uh, and as we can see here from comrades in Chile, he, they can cause uh, eye loss from these injuries. And we're seeing a lot of that. I saw a young man from Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, lost his eye when he was hit in the eye with a rubber bullet and his actual eyeball uh, ruptured and he had to have it surgically removed and has lost his eye. Um, so, so these kinetic injuries uh, uh, are important. These come out of, you know, a uh, uh, large four millimeter um, guns. So if you see something that looks like the Terminator, if you're not familiar uh, with guns, something like Arnold Schwarzenegger shoots and blows things up with, that's what these things come out of. Uh, also, if you see shotguns uh, that are primarily bright kind of safety orange, those have beanbag rounds, which is lead shot wrapped in a, a, a little piece of cloth or Kevlar. Uh, 
I just saw, I believe it was Dallas, maybe it was Houston, a young person had their skull cracked just the other night when he was shot close range with one of these devices. Uh, I should note that uh, these devices are now called less lethal weapons. And two decades ago, they were called non-lethal weapons because they claimed they couldn't kill people with this stuff. But police, in their egregious and irresponsible use of these uh, pieces of equipment, and have found that they are more than capable of killing individuals with any number of these devices. So many of them, uh, when inappropriately used, do have the capacity for fatal injury. So the one kind of injury, um, again, with these rubber bullets, in addition to being shot at the face, um, they get shot at the chest. And at close range, there's a case report of um, death through exsanguination from pulmonary artery rupture. I included the link below. Um, and when I was at Standing Rock, I saw a young man who actually had a very similar contusion on his chest wall, who came um, back from the front line and, and ended up coughing a, about a cup of dark red blood um, into his hand. Um, and so these, uh, these weapons are intense um, and um, these people need to be stabilized and taken to a higher level of care immediately. All right, stun grenades. These are another uh, um, device that have caused uh, permanently maiming injuries uh, and certainly have the potential for causing fatal injuries. These, these are devices that uh, are typically used in breaching buildings by tactical teams. Uh, they set off an extremely high decibel bang as well as a very bright incendiary burst to uh, hopefully blind and overwhelm the hearing, disorienting people to allow for uh, uh, the tactical team to overwhelm them with their force, or in protest situations, for uh, police to rush in and detain many people uh, while they're disoriented or uh, further harm people while they're disoriented. Um, we've seen from Standing Rock that one of these caused a grievous injury to our comrade Sophia Wolanski. He, uh, this is after multiple surgeries uh, at what is uh, pretty much as repaired as her limb is going to be able to get. Uh, no litigation has happened yet against the police departments that deployed this because the shrapnel that was taken from her wound was taken by the FBI as evidence against her, uh, but was found to be uh, one of the parts of one of these devices. Uh, but has not been released to legal teams. Um, so this was life uh, uh, near limb losing injury. This is a baby who one of these devices landed in their crib uh, when a SWAT team was using a no-knock warrant. Uh, here is another example of someone who had one of these devices burst at head level near them. And again, these are devices that are supposed to be, you know, rolled across the ground or skittered across the ground uh, to happen at ground level to avoid these sorts of potential injuries. Um, uh, these are another really, really nasty one. These are completely overwhelming. These not only have the bright flash and super loud decibels, these have rubber pellets in them as well as CS, powdered CS, uh, powdered tear gas. Uh, so they not only the, uh, explode with an extraordinarily loud noise and pyrotechnic burst, they also release a chemical irritant and small rubber bullets. Uh, we saw during the student demonstrations up in Quebec a few years back that a number of people also lost eyes from these, again, because these are supposed to be used to uh, injure lower extremities, ideally, uh, to incapacitate people. Oh, but when police lob these overhead, uh, so they detonate at head level, there's potential for fatal and maiming injury. Uh, here are some other, you know, uh, common causes of kinetic injuries. Uh, we see here on the left, uh, baton charges. Uh, de depending on the police department, some uh, police departments that are more professional have learned to uh, only jab at solar plexus level or hit lower extremities when they're in close quarters with the crowd, rather than that classic overhand swing uh, from you know, the 68 National Convention uh, that looks like they're just golfing protesters. Uh, 
characters. They do that purely for PR reasons. Uh, you know, good jab with one of these to the solar plexus, especially at the xiphoid process, can be a, a, a potentially lethal injury. Um, horses, uh, horses are commonly misabused by police departments as weapons. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know what to say. Like getting stepped on by a horse sucks, um, especially when they do it, ride them through uh, uh, seated protesters. Uh, we've also seen a number of instances of vehicular attacks on demonstrators. Uh, uh, Charlottesville, obviously, you know, there was a fatal attack. Myself and other uh, medics were there treating the previously injured, and we're even giving kudos by uh, local rescue because every patient was being attended to by the time EMS was allowed there. But we first were approached by riot cops and tanks uh, before they would come in and treat the injured. This is again why it's so important uh, to have yourselves placed within the protest bounds rather than outside. Um, and here we see the police using their vehicles as a weapon in New York. Uh, similarly, we saw in Minneapolis, the driver of a tractor trailer full of fuel try and run down a protest of thousands of people after driving around police barricades. All right, tasers. I want to give a big shout out to UCF's cardiology department because I hear they've kept uh, tasers out of the hands of the San Francisco Police Department, uh, and that's great. Tasers are awful weapons. These are weapons uh, uh, that are, you know, modulated from old cattle prods uh, to, to either be deployed uh, directly with a handheld device or even riot shields come with electrical uh, uh, activators so they can push and shock. Um, what we're most common seeing is the, the Taser International tasers which shoot two barbed projectiles that are designed to go up through up to an inch of clothing uh, and then deliver an extraordinarily powerful shock uh, to just cancel out our body's own like electrical chemical uh, communication with itself. So you seize up, sometimes they scream, and then they all tend to fall over. Uh, which is important when we're assessing patients who have been tased, that we find those impaled objects. You know? so I've had to pull an impaled object, an impaled uh, taser barb out of an individual's face in the field. So we had to assess very carefully for where it was uh, for any possible vascular involvement uh, as well as uh, nerve involvement because we didn't want to cause any airway problems. Uh, similarly, they fell. So there's uh, that kind of fall injury. They might have broken an elbow, cracked a head. Uh, also, they've usually had their, their uh, metabolism, their electrolytes gone to shit. Uh, and so you want to monitor them for up to eight hours uh, to 12 hours afterwards for possible dysrhythmias and cardiac events. Um, the LRAD. Straight out of sci-fi, the long-range acoustic device. These are square devices uh, that are technically public announce systems. So uh, sometimes you'll see a smaller version hanging off a white shirt officer's shoulder while they read out the orders to disperse. Uh, these are also deployed on um, armored vehicles to use as a dispersal device. Uh, they use very high pitch uh, uh, sound waves and sound projected directly uh, to, you know, just be painful, cause headaches. Um, uh, There's still uh, audiologists I've spoken to about this have been horrified that they deploy these willy-nilly. Um, but this is another device we're seeing lots of places, lots of police departments have them. Uh, and, you know, you can wear earplugs, decibel reducing earplugs are one thing. Thing, uh, and they also come out at a, a specific angle that you can look up in that uh, excited delirium zine, uh, what that angle is. And you could just step kind of outside that angle. And then it's just like some bad EDM that they're playing. You know, it's just some bad, you know, it's if you listen to punk or loud music, you're, you'll be fine just like, you know, 10 feet to the side. But if you're directly in front of it, boy, is that loud. So the other um, last injury we'll touch upon is psychological injury, um, both for our patients that we're treating, like we spoke about before, but then also for ourselves. Um, 
there's a lot of chaos in these protests. Um, the weapons, like Noah described, are meant to create psychological fear um, as well as um, physical harm. Um, and so people need treatment for their trauma. You will need treatment if you are um, taking care of people in this, um, in this setting, especially going from a controlled clinical setting. We're still in that setting. We need to process our trauma um, from the loss of our patients. Um, but, it's, but especially in this situation. Um, for myself, um, probably one of the most intense experiences I had was when that young man who was hit with a rubber grenade at close range, coughed a cup of blood into, into his hand, um, was to realize that I couldn't call 911 for help. Um, this was at Standing Rock where the ambulances and um, were, you know, working with the sheriff's department, like the whole 911 response was involved in trying to shut down the um, indigenous resistance to this pipeline. So feeling like you can't call 911, you can't get help when you need it, you can't call a code, um, that you're there with your um, clinical team there um, doing the best you can, hopefully moving that person as quickly as you can to safety. But that encountering of your limitations um, is very um, scary, as well as seeing people who are injured in police custody um, with, that the police won't let you approach them and help them. That is another um, very traumatic event for um, healthcare professionals. Um, so for, for caring for yourself, I think it's important after these events to go through a process with your colleagues, with your friends, um, people who are there with you, but especially your, your medics, your um, street medicine teams. And to think about the rose, we use the rose, the thorn, the bud um, conceptualization. So the rose, what was the high point of the service that you gave and the experience? What was the low point, the thorn? And then what's the bud, something that you wish should happen differently, some potential area to grow um, or to do um, differently next time. It's important to learn now, I think before you enter these protests about trauma-informed therapy um, and care. Um, some people have had a lot of success with trauma-informed care um, with ceremony, with a technique called EMDR, with herbal medicines and psilocybin. There's some interesting research on that. But I, I know that medicine, Western medicine, tends not to be the best to deal with PTSD and, and chronic um, and trauma like this. So I would um, try to get yourself plugged in and prepared um, before, before, you, um, before you are in the fray, if you can. And um, I just wanted to remind everyone as we've gone through this um, you know, outlining of all the ways that our um, the bodies of protesters and um, our bodies are being injured and these are people exercising um, their First Amendment right to speak up um, for their right to health and their right for justice. Um, and that we are um, paying for these weapons. Um, it is shocking to me to watch the militarization of San Francisco and Oakland when we don't have enough money for um, PPE for everybody and we don't have enough money for hotel rooms for our unhoused friends or services for our unhoused friends um, that we have enough money to roll in you know tanks and all this weaponry so it is really time for us to start thinking about the allocation of our funding and how we can really prioritize a culture of care and a culture of health. Noah, do you want to run through? Yep. Uh, so here are just uh, some uh, good resources that are out there. There's really great, uh, cutely animated um, general protest safety info oh, is at this uh, friendly neighborhood street medic Tumblr page. Um, this next link under bail funds, this is a running list of all the different cities that have and their bail funds. Uh, so, you know, we, we'd encourage you to, you know, so if you have the means to help get some other people out of jail. Um, Excited Delirium, this is the link to the, the police weapons zine I was speaking about earlier. Uh, it goes into loads of details and schematics and specifics of what is known about the like solvents in some of these uh, different companies, proprietary blends. Uh, uh, goes into like actual muzzle velocities, manufacturing specifications of a lot of these weapons, as well as a section that at the time was things coming down the line that includes several weapons we've now started seeing deployed. 
uh, here to support this work. This is, uh, if you want to direct money towards me, I'll redistribute it to various grassroots street medic organizations that uh, I work with around the country and who are doing amazing work on the ground. Uh, and here is a link to the Do No Harm Coalition if you want to support their work. Yeah, so um, we will also direct funding towards equipping uh, street medic teams and then also share um, any funding with our, our coalition members that we're working with right now to get unhoused people off the streets. Um, now in San Francisco, we're increasingly alarmed because most unhoused people um, get harassed by the police. And um, with this curfew, um, even though they're technically exempt, um, people of color are disproportionately represented in the house people in San Francisco, and it's um, absolutely urgent that we get them safe shelter as soon as possible. Um, so we do this work that we do, that we do this work um, in, in, in order to move the needle more just quickly, because um, we are tired of seeing black and brown people die at the hands of the police. Um, and we are tired of incremental change. We need we need more um, we need more dramatic change um, immediately. And so we this is why we do this work, and we do this work to uplift the people who have lost their lives to police violence and their families. So we thank you for being here. Um, we are going to post this PDF onto the Do No Harm Coalition website. We'll also share it in the Eventbrite um, uh, event page. And then we will be putting the recording of this session up on YouTube for people to um, circulate and share. All right, and now we are at the question and answer. Wow, we're right on time, shocking. So let's see. Noah, would um, you like to? Mike, could you feed us some of the questions you've gathered uh, into the chat and we can read them out loud and address them? Yes, just a moment here. Um, so I've been actually collecting, uh, there's, thank you everyone for, for, for asking so many really excellent questions. I'll, I'll, um, feed you some of the questions. I've sort of sorted them by by type, um, and so let me let me send you some now. There's a question of how many people are on the stream. Um, I saw up to 3,100 people on the stream, um, which is really exciting that so many people um, felt the need to learn this information. There was a question of whether or not there'll be another training, like further training. We'll have to see what our capacity is. Um, we're still working on COVID, as we all know. Um, and, and I just want to thank Noah, who jumped at this opportunity to put this together with me, um, literally within a day. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, someone offered to transcribe and create closed captioning for this recording. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch with you. Um, I see a lot of questions uh, about folks asking of more specific use of uh, how Pseudocon is used. Pseudocon uh, in its commercial variety is just like a big wet wet, uh, a wet wipe. Uh, and so you're going to use it to wipe, you know, and decontaminate, decontaminate skin. Um, the, there is some citric acid in there, so you want to be extra careful if you're using it around people's eyes. Um, but one thing we do see is oftentimes you get, after you get chemical weapons out of someone's eyes, they still have the, the ocular muscles kind of spasming there. And so they're all squinty eyes. You can't really open their eyes. And so some of the Sudicon, uh and other things like that, uh, slight massage could help you know, relieve and uh, uh, keep those muscles from any spasming thing. But the Sudicon, skin only, uh, and super careful around the eyes, uh, and I wouldn't put it in wounds. Uh, I saw someone ask that. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that came up was, would you um, check, take your ID with you? That's a really good question. I know that um, many medical providers are worried about um, the legal implications of getting arrested or their um, the threat to their license. 
Um, so for myself in San Francisco, in the Bay Area, San Francisco and Oakland, when I show up, I do bring my ID, um, especially right now during COVID um, with these curfews, we are essential um, providers. So if anything, we are exempt from the curfew, which might be even a better reason for us to be showing up to advocate more for our, um, for our black and brown community. Um, when I was in North Dakota, I absolutely did not bring my ID with me. I also didn't bring my telephone with me on actions. Um, so some, we relied on um, walkie talkies there and you know, they, the telephones or our smartphones are basically devices that can help track us as we've seen with COVID when they would publish like how far did people drive? They're using our cell phone data. Um, so they track where we are um, and you might not want that information. So you'll, you'll have to decide for yourself um, when you want to bring those things. Um, I'm just gonna um, I, walk through, walk through uh, some of these yeah. questions on scope um, yes. that I'm being read. Uh, the first question I, I'm seeing is what level is training uh, required in order to practice safely as a street medic? Uh, so for non-professionally trained medical pr uh, personnel, we usually will do what a 20 hour basic street medic training, which includes a comprehensive coverage of basic life support and interventions, uh, as well as police weapons and violence and uh, some of our street tactics and ethos uh, and goes a little bit more into critical incident stress, uh, mental health work uh, and peer support. Um, and so this bridge training, you know, it, street medics tend to question each other who, if they don't know you in the streets where they're working. Uh, so they'll probably ask you, where did you get trained? You could say, you know, I'm a doctor from UCSF and I got bridge training from NOAA uh, uh, during the COVID. Um, you know, or, you know, people will be like, you know, I was trained uh, by folks uh, from on the ground medical in New York City in the Bronx in 2002. Uh, and I would list my trainers and there's a limited number of our trainers. So that's how we kind of uh, uh, vet people and we mentor folks in the streets. Um, as far as scope of practice of where, where, what level you can safely practice to. I mostly recommend only going to basic life support uh, interventions. You don't need to be trying to like trach anyone or like, you know, put a chest tube in in the field. We're not there yet. Um, you know, uh, uh, if you're, you're licensed, you're, you're probably not supposed to be giving someone a EpiPen or something like that. But oftentimes I've found like people's EpiPen suddenly fall out of their pocket when they're having an anaphylaxis. Uh, and then you can assist them in using their EpiPen or assist them in using the inhaler that appropriately appeared almost by magic at the right time. Um, but, you know, it's, it's up to us to like, you know, be where our comfort level is. You know, if things go further, you know, uh, if you work with undocumented communities, you know, I know there are folks who are in telemedicine right now uh, with folks who are too afraid to go to the hospitals because of the police violence. Um, and so, you know, that's going to be more private. That's going to be less publicly available or viewable for what you're doing. So I really just got to advise you all to use your best, best uh, uh, sense and your, follow your own heart as far as um, where you go. Uh, uh, you know, again, I wouldn't, wouldn't, would refrain from doing a lot of things you might know how to do in the streets. Like if we have a brick and mortar clinic elsewhere, uh, as we often do in mass mobilizations, uh, you know, there's often a room that doesn't, like a room of requirements for you Harry Potter's fan. You know, this door doesn't really exist, but when you need it, this door exists, and there are good things in this back room uh, if we got care for someone in those ways. Uh, uh, so yeah, or there's a bit of magic to street medicine. Sometimes, you know, uh, there's a lot of gray area of comfort, you know, some of us who have wilderness training have certainly argued to ourselves uh, that given the situation and the chaos, the patient is more than an hour away from definitive care, so I can feel comfortable using my wilderness protocols. So Noah, that, um, goes, to, that goes to a question that came up about EMS. So, um, it, it, so if you just take a moment, if you've been in a protest, um, try to think of the last time you saw an ambulance or EMS there tending to wounded people who've been, um, you know, subjected to chemical weapons and um, police 
um, kinetic injuries. I, I haven't seen it. They come later. They come after the protest has actually moved away um, and the patients are left. So um, it's not that they're not there at all, um, but um, it's that they're there much later. And so your role in street medicine is to temporize, to stabilize, to treat until you can get them moved to a higher level of care. Um, and in certain political environments, such as Standing Rock, where we were in the plains of North Dakota, where the um, histories of um, racist violence between the settlers um, and the indigenous people meant that the, the ambulances weren't really there for us. Um, and so you just have to get a good read of what your political situation is. Um, in the in the context that you're working. Um, so um, there's not a one size fits all, but it's just really understanding. In any event, um, EMS is not gonna run in um, to the foray. Um, they'll wait until the foray has either moved or you have moved um, the, the patient. Another person asked if they are, are do no harm chapters around the country and that is um, something that is just starting to grow. So we came together in 2016. Some of the images I shared were from the hunger strike in San Francisco, which is where we got our foundation with supporting um, community members here uh, who were on strike, hunger strike, protesting police violence in San Francisco. Um, and um, we have made a mission statement, a manifesto, if you will, that um, we would love to see and has already starting to be replicated around the country. So we want different coalitions to self-organize and to abide by certain principles of organization um, that are decolonizing principles so that we can each grow in our um, capacity for advocacy and our capacity to support um, as many structural changes as possible to alleviate suffering as effectively as we can. There were people in the um, questions who asked about mentorship. Um, if, if you're at UCSF, come um, sign up for Do No Harm um, on our website. And, um, and there's many, many mentors um, who you can avail yourself of. And if you're not at UCSF and you would love, um, reach out to me personally through uh, my UCSF email and I'll see if I can find someone who can help support you. Uh, and to answer a popular question of how do we find street medic organizations doing this work in our area? Um, there might not be, depending on where you are. are. There are a lot of street medic collectives peppered around the country. Um, you know, North Star Health Collective in, around the Twin Cities. My collective, which is more bioregional here in Appalachia, Appalachian Medical Solidarity, New York City Action Medical, uh, obviously in New York, uh, Boston Action Medical, uh, Western Cascadia uh, Street Medics uh, outside Seattle, uh, Rose Hips uh, Medical Collective in uh, Portland, uh, Frontline Medics down in the Southwest. There are loads of medic groups. Um, so, you know, I would, you know, search on Facebook to see if there are groups. We, we don't tend to hide ourselves. Uh, one of the graces that we can bring to the movement is 99% of our organizing efforts can be done in the open, where they're providing care for people. Uh, there's no laws against providing med like first aid, aid um, to people if you so choose. Um, uh, there are lots of questions about scope of practice. Um, so it's just, um, so anyone who knows BLS, so basic life support and first aid can get involved in street medic work. Um, you should just be very honest about your level of training and know where you are stepping, you know, where your limits are of your capacity. Um, so I think that, um, you know, as a physician, there's, you know, not much limit to what I can do in terms of giving meds or um, assessing people. Um, but as a medical student um, or someone who's not licensed, those are just things to consider. Um, again, if you're in an emergency situation where someone could possibly die without the use of their EpiPen, um, that those are you know, circumstances where, um, where you would be protected. So I think those laws are also specific to um, particular um, localities. So just check up, um, just Google your Good Samaritan laws in your, in your area. Um, 
we're being asked to clarify when to use water versus other solutions for tear gas and pepper spray. Hey, so uh, for the eyes, nothing but water, medical saline. Y'all may have more ready access to medical saline than a lot of us. Uh, but yeah, water or medical saline, only thing we put in the eyes is what we recommend. Uh, UCSF has a study that shows Maalox uh, on the skin uh, to be soothing. Um, there are a lot of bad rumors going around. Milk, we don't want to do milk. If you're out, it's summertime. If you're carrying milk around all day out in the heat, you're going to be dumping curds in someone's eyes as well as a ton of bacteria. You, know, you don't want to be giving them pink eyes as well as a chemical burn in the eye. Uh, 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 again, Maalox, we want that for the skin. Um, water, if it's deemed potable, I've been told, is okay for flushing. If you can drink it, you can flush it in someone's eyes. Um, as far as follow-up for chemical irritants, uh, uh, we want to think about what systems, uh, as medical workers, we can think about what uh, physiological systems are being affected by, by these chemical irritants. And it's primarily our livers and our kidneys are going to be the ones filtering this crap out of our body after it's gotten in there. So, you know, the same kind of dark leafy green, you know, dark green veggies that, that your liver is going to really like, as well as loads and loads and loads of water um, to help your body and your kidneys flush this stuff out. Um, when the YouTube goes up, we'll add some links to some one pagers about uh, herbal chemical detoxification uh, from a good herbalist uh, who is a longtime part of the Bay Area Radical Health Collective. There's also a question about what medical students can do um, who have, you know, they're just at their clerkship level. They're just starting to do their clinical work. So um, your role can definitely be supportive, um, showing up with your white coat, bringing extra masks and gloves for people. We are in the midst of COVID um, to help remind people how to stay safe during a pandemic if they're protesting, bringing a ton of water um, to help prevent dehydration and also to um, be able to hand over to our street medics to help with ir eye irrigation. And then um, I would just find a, someone with more experience to tag along with and to um, assist. And so this is a great learning opportunity for you as well as, um, you know, just like you would learn in the hospital, this is a great chance to learn. And people um, who are there who have more experience can assess where you are with um, what you can do and, and ask you to you know, chip in. Just tell people very honestly what your level of skill is, how much clinical experience you've had, um, and don't be shy about it. This is a great opportunity to train people. Um, I was All right, one last story. Is makeup bad? Yeah, so makeup and uh, contacts are not good because both of these things can trap the um, CS, uh, the solid, the fine powder of tear gas, um, as well as um, just interact with the, the other chemicals. So yeah, don't wear makeup. Um, don't wear lotions on your face. Keep a bare, bare skin and glasses. All right, I'm seeing what types of masks will and will not protect against tear gas and pepper spray. Hey, uh, tear gas, uh, you need to have filtration that's pretty much going to filter out volatile organic chemicals. Um, so I, what I recommend is a half face respirator and goggles or a full face respirator uh, that you can buy at any Lowe's or Home Depot or hardware store. Hopefully you still have a local hardware store and it's not just Lowe's and Home Depot. Uh, but the, those are uh, great because um, you can get impact resistant goggles and the cartridges are readily available uh, around the country. Um, and those are the only ones that I know will actually allow you to operate in a setting where there's tear gas. Um, N95s uh, and those sorts will help uh, and have, help you be less affected. Um, with pepper spray, because it's oil-based rather than an aerosolized particulate, uh, just ha avoiding getting it on your skin is great. A build cap like this, you can turn your head down if you see the spray coming, so your hat catches it rather than your kissing. Um, similarly, uh, we talk about bandanas like, yeah. You know, so any covering over the face is going to give you a little bit of more filtration or protection from these 
than a bear face. Uh, and hopefully right now, everyone's wearing their masks already. Um, so uh, uh, working for that uh, actual respirator or full face respirator with the organic vapor cartridges is, is the, a key. A note on gas masks, gas masks tend to be more expensive and harder to find their filter cartridges. Also civilian gas masks usually have uh, glass for the eyelets, which can be shattered by an impact round and potentially send glass shards into the eyes. So if you're gonna get a gas mask, make sure it's military grade or for uh, at the very least, tape those lenses inside and out with packaging tape. Uh, so if it does get an impact, it's less likely to have shards or splinters. Someone asked about the role of history taking in the patient encounter, the initial patient encounter. And um, yes, of course, we should be taking um, just a brief history to know if there are any pre-existing conditions that might impact how that person is responding. Like, are they diabetic? Do they have asthma? Um, are they allergic to any medications? So those kinds of basic um, history taking skills are, are super important in any, in any patient encounter. We would assume that you would translate it here. Yep. Uh, uh, best practices for moving injured comrades from danger uh, to safety in the context of possible C-spine injuries and skull fractures. Um, so so uh, what we have to move these folks, um, you know, we're, we've gotten to a, a, a potential disability rather than a probable death situation in the critical uh, uh, injury of our patients. And uh, EMS personnel are, are a lot more well-versed in this already. He, uh, if you're wilderness trained, you get trained on what's called beaming, which is kind of people standing across from each other and putting their arms on each other like this to make squares. Uh, uh, so we can, or linking arms underneath the patient so we can move them in a kind of group basket. Um, I would recommend folks, if they're interested in this, especially if you find local street medics, to ask for training on lifts and carries. Uh, these are super important EMS personnel, uh, especially search and rescue folks, will know some of these wilderness uh, uh, things. Banners, if there's a really good, solid, taut, like strong banner, you can like put someone in a banner uh, and have it taught like a scoop stretcher. Uh, 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 that is used in a lot of places around the world um, still, especially if it's still got its holes on it and you could potentially move someone quite well. Uh, uh, it's important that, you know, whoever is maintaining uh, spinal immobilization at the head is the one directing all the movements, all the lifts. You know, uh, if you're doing these things, you want to be super careful uh, uh, that you're communicating well so you don't drop that patient. Uh, legal implications for licensure if arrested, that's, that's going to depend on your licensing board and which state you're in. I, as an EMT, uh, when I was still an EMT, uh, uh, never had any issue with the, the misdemeanor arrests I, I've taken. Uh, the only times I've been arrested, uh, when I've been medicating, I beat all those charges. Um, I've been both kept on staff and hired on with open cases. Um, I know plenty of nurses who have gotten arrested. Uh, again, uh, most of the time, if it's not a crime of moral turpitude, you're not stealing someone, uh, stealing from someone, you're not abusing, you know, children or geriatric folks or domestic partners. There's most of those, if you're not at the felony level, uh, uh, you might have to write, but uh, I've never known of folks um, I mean, I have a friend who's an EMT who got a blocking an emergency vehicles charge, medicating folks who blockaded a highway. He's working as an EMT. He got hired as an EMT with a felony blocking emergency vehicles charge. Um, so it, it really depends on your, your uh, uh, state licensure board, be that medical board, nursing board, um, DOT if you're an EMT. Uh, and so you're going to have to really check your own uh, licensure boards and state regulations. So I see a question about an opto follow-up for tear gas exposure. Um, so the symptoms of tear gas exposure, if you're not, um, so if you're not re-inoculating your eye, like re-exposing the eyes is about 20 minutes. 
Um, so we would not expect, you can have some chemical irritation from it um, that can last a little longer. But I would say if it's lasting for, in the day, um, in, for days, that you should absolutely get checked um, by an ophthalmologist, by an eye expert. Um, I'm seeing a number of questions about where do we get our gear, various types of gear. There are a lot of street medics where uh, uh, medical professionals or folks do a lot of uh, harm reduction work. Um, so some of us kind of glean uh, uh, excesses from places that we work. Um, when I used to be a, a field phlebotomist, they'd give me a box, whole box of you know, alcohol pads and, and gauze pads for, for one remote visit. Um, so there's a lot of waste in healthcare that can be gleaned. Uh, Narcan, you know, um, Narcan is something that our comrades who do a lot more of the work in harm reduction are uh, shuffling around uh, the country already. So usually uh, uh, a lot of street medics will be tapped into uh, harm reduction circles. And so if we're going to be carrying Narcan, we get it from where everyone else gets it, whatever our local harm reduction or health department is able to uh, distribute. Um, as far as if there are any organizations that hope to provide supplies, um, there aren't really that I'm aware of. Uh, uh, we tend to do our own fundraisings when we do trainings, um, especially if it's like for college or university groups, we try to get uh, more than our base expenses covered so we can put money back to our collective supplies. Uh, a lot of y'all may have better opportunities with your medical licensure to set up um, accounts with medical supply companies. Uh, and oftentimes you can negotiate deals on stuff and then you can do group ordering. A lot of times if you're uh, working with a collective, you can pool resources. You know, some of these things only come in huge amounts uh, or you need to buy them in larger amounts to uh, uh, get a good deal. Uh, but if you have 10 people who all pitched in 25 bucks, you know, $250 of first aid supplies can, can outfit, you know, 10 to a dozen medics pretty well. Um, so, so we just kind of have to figure out, you have fundraising shows, you, you know, we do what we can. I saw uh, Target got looted and there was donations afterwards to uh, on the ground medics working in the street. So you know, the supplies come like in disasters through donations, wherever they come from a lot of times. So, um, see here, one issue that um, people are just asking about CS gas and how we prepare, um, one, what, what we can do. I think as the medical community, we could really raise our voices here about eliminating CS gas against civilians in the United States. Um, it's dangerous. It's a chemical weapon that's outlined by the Geneva Convention, um, and it's going to make things worse during COVID. So if um, anyone is down for following up with Dr. Peter Chin Hong here at UCSF. Um, he wrote an excellent letter. We should um, amplify that and, um, and make that move as a medical community. Okay, um, Noah, can you answer this one? Best practices for moving an injured person like a C-spine injury um, from the front line to the back line? Spinal and Yeah, I did just speak to that a little bit, but you know, really arguably the best answer is very careful. Um, we've seen uh, numerous instances this past week and historically, uh, um, y'all there in the Bay Area, Scott Olson, when he was shot in the head close range with a, a tear gas canister that cracked his skull, uh, the initial caregivers who rushed to him, police threw those sting balls at them to drive them away and injure him further. Um, so, so, you know, uh, I recommend you you uh, take the time to, to speak with EMS personnel or wilderness trained folks about uh, lifts and carries and how those lifts and carries are trained and taught in the field uh, and practice those, especially if you're getting together with a group, it's a great time to practice moving someone when the person is only playing injured. Yeah, and so also this is, an, you know, because the situation is dynamic, if you can leave that person stabilized, like I said, EMS will come once the protest has moved. If there's not the constant threat of violence, um, if that person can be left there still and protected um, until EMS can come with a spinal immobilizing board, um, that's also a, a, a reasonable way of addressing that. 
yeah, this may very well be a, a situation where you're choosing to stay and keep your patient in spinal immobilization uh, while a police line advances possibly over y'all. Yeah, this is a real question that you have to go back to your situational awareness and scene assessment and see how the police have been behaving. Uh, have they just been uh, 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 relatively peaceably arresting people who are just sitting in front of their advancing police line while everyone else is dispersing? Or are they kicking the shit out of those people? You know, you got to decide what's going to be potentially safer for your patient who has a potential mechanism of injury for a spinal injury. Is it going to be safer for you to try and speak to the fact that y'all are medics, that this patient can't be moved without EMS, and hope the police kind of just move around you and like y'all are detained, but y'all are still allowed to keep that patient? If the police have been acting in such an irresponsible way uh, that it is likely safer to try and move that patient with the utmost care and precautions to a safer venue where uh, uh, they can get con continuity of care. So with that, we're going to wrap it up and say thank you to everybody. There's a lot of questions that we didn't have a chance to answer. Um, please follow the Do No Harm Coalition on Twitter, at Do No Harm UCSF. Um, we're online as well, do no harm coalition.org. We'll be releasing the justice study um, findings there. We'll be releasing, we'll upload this PDF there with active hyperlinks um, and all the um, citations that we can stick in there for you. Um, and I just want to thank Noah um, and Dorothy and Mike, our tech support and UCSF for helping us to host this and get the word out. And yes, um, please share this when this video is out. Please share it if you think it can be useful to people in your community to help um, organize to protect the safety of our people. Uh, and I'm at Noah for Health on Twitter. Uh, I help ampl amplify a lot of the struggle going on out there in the streets there. Um, and I'd just like to say, Cook Stetchum, uh, thank you for all of you uh, uh, who took the time to attend this and are, are uh, even considering to go out and break the bystander syndrome uh, and provide care during these revolutionary uh, and inspiring times. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.